Welcome back everyone, it's me Matt, thank you again for joining me today, we're talking about artillery and that of the old school World War II British kind, the 17 pounder gun. Now being that I am an artillery gunner here in Canada, I take great pride in talking about guns of which my own nations have used clearly both the United Kingdom or Britain and Canada as of today. Uh, not quite using this gun, <laughs> we're pretty close to it. But honestly, anti-tank gun warfare is really interesting to me because it's not something, of course, we really do nowadays in actually using anti-tank guns. Uh, of course, we use anti-tank missiles and tanks themselves. The anti-tank gun platform or premise of artillery is really not so much a thing anymore. It's still capable on some of the howitzers to engage tank um, you know, targets, but for the most part, it's left down to uh, the real boys in the business that are actually taking out tanks. But back in World War II, this was a very formidable anti-tank platform that could knock out a few tanks or two. Now, by 1942, the six-pounder was starting to become pretty obsolete as the newer German tanks became even more heavily armoured. But back in 1940, the subject of a pretty eventual replacement for the six-pounder had been raised. What was proposed was a 3-inch or 76mm weapon firing a 17-pound shot. By early 1942, prototypes had been built, tested and approved, and by May 1942, the 17-pounder gun had been formally introduced. This was a considerable leap forward, and the 17-pounder was to become one of the most formidable anti-tank guns of the war. Of course, we all know of the 88mm of the Germans, one of the best anti-tank platform guns that has ever been produced, but the 17-pounder was definitely in a close second place. As the first guns were being produced, news of the appearance of the German Tiger tank, so about 100 of the 17-pounder barrels were fitted to 25-pounder carriages, as the proper 17-pounder split trail carriages were not ready, and flown to North Africa in 1943 to counter this new threat. The guns were codenamed Pheasant, officially known as the 17-pounder Mark II, and proved remarkably stable and robust in use. They served until the correct mounts were available, but it took quite a while for them to get there, and also the retrofit also took quite some time. It should be noted that although these guns were rushed to North Africa to combat the Tiger tank, it was in fact the 6-pounder which claimed the first Tiger kill. The gun went to be mounted on the beautiful Sherman Firefly, one of my favourite World War II tanks, and the Challenger tank and the Achilles, and also the Archer tank destroyers. While the 6-pounder was a powerful weapon when it was designed, by November 1940 the talk of the replacement had begun, and therefore the 6-pounder wasn't even in production at this time. Some argued for an 8-pounder gun to be the replacement, but the gun wouldn't have had enough power compared to the 6-pounder it was to replace. Shortly afterward, a new request for a gun of capable of penetrating 120mm to 150mm of armour plate at 800 yards was issued. This was of course a very demanding requirement of a gun of this time. Several possible gun shell combinations have been calculated to meet this requirement, one of which was the 3 inch firing gun of the 17 pound shell at 2700 feet per second. It was this design that was the final chosen replacement for the 6 pounder. Before the new gun was designed, the possibility of modifying an existing gun to meet the request was mulled over, but due to the demanding specifications, no satisfactory conversion could be found other than the changing of the 25 pounder frame. Shortly thereafter, the armaments design department prepared a wooden mock-up, but they were perturbed, quote, by the enormous size of the gun and the carriage. This wasn't a problem because the gun was to be towed, and in July, an order of four pilot models were tested. Testing continued through early 1942, and, as mentioned before, in May 1942, the 17-pounder was fully accepted for production across the British Army. The 17-pounder was given a solid steel shot as initial service rounds. An improved armoured piercing shell with a penetrating cap shortly replaced this. The addition of the penetrating cap allowed for greater penetration against the face-hardened armour that protected most German armoured vehicles at the time, but it gave no benefit against homogeneous armour. Soon, a newer shell with a ballistic cap in addition to penetrating cap appeared and became the service round for the rest of the war. The ballistic cap helped reduce drag on the shell and gave a much better long-range performance. When equipped with all this, the APCBC round for the 17-pounder was by far the best anti-tank gun on the Allied side, and was able to punch straight through the frontal armour of the much feared Tiger. While the normal full caliber AP rounds used on the 17-pounder were quite powerful, shortly after the introduction of the 17-pounder, the idea of discarding Sabo shot for the 17-pounder was being investigated. Work on this round proceeded throughout 1943, and by April 1944 the round was ready for production. The APDS round was finally issued to troops that of August and proved incredibly effective. It could penetrate over 200mm armour at 1000m. For its time, that's pretty impressive, folks. 
This shell was highly demanded and there was always a shortage of these rounds considering the number of tanks they were engaging in any one time during the war. It was very difficult to keep the market of these rounds flowing to the gunline. After the war, the APDS rounds became the standard AP round for all tank and anti-tank guns at the time. While the many of the latter AP rounds for the 17 pounder were very effective, the original high explosive round was found to be very severely lacking. First of all, the shell had an unusually small filling of explosive. This was because of the high velocity of the gun forced the designers to give the shell a thick wall to withstand the high g-forces during acceleration. Secondly, the high velocity of the shell often caused the round to ricochet off the ground before exploding some distance beyond the target. Once these problems became apparent, a new HE round with a reduced propelling charge and thinner shell was actually designed. This round was a major improvement of the old HE round and was very effective against buildings, bunkers and of course infantry projecting towards the gun line itself. In addition to the towed gun, the 17 pounder had many self-propelled versions. The first of these was the Archer, which was a Valentine tank with the fixed superstructure built on top. This superstructure had to be mounted backwards due to the size of the gun. But this wasn't too much of a problem as the crews often use it as an ambush weapon retreating after firing, therefore allowing the vehicle to drive and scoot right out of the area without having to reverse or change gears to get into reverse, which at the time transmissions were quite complicated to get it moving again. And British tanks were not known to reverse very well. Uh, maybe it's our stiff upper lip, we didn't have the requirement to have our tanks reverse quickly, but the Archer really mitigated this by having it pointing in the right direction in the first place. By far the most famous self-propelled 17-pounder though was the beautiful modified Sherman as I mentioned, the Firefly. Another self-propelled 17-pounder was the Achilles. This started life as a Lend-Lease M10, but the British found the original 3-inch gun quite weak and replaced it with the beautiful 17-pounder. <coughs> British engineering. <laughs> the final 17-pounder was the experimental Strausler conversion. It was a heavily modified 17 pounder that was fitted with an auxiliary power unit so it could move under its own power when a vehicle wasn't available to tow it. Although the Strausler conversion did not enter service due to concerns about its large size, the concept of an auxiliary power unit did not die out. During the 1980s, many armies began to fit APUs to their artillery guns so they could move on their own power to avoid counter battery fire. While the 17 pounder was a powerful weapon, by 1942 a replacement was already being designed. The intended replacement, the 32 pounder, never actually entered service because the weapon was bogged down in development, and the 17 pounder was able to handle just about any German tank at the time, except perhaps the King Tiger and some of the more heavily armoured artillery platforms which for the most part would not have seen engagement anyway. Also, the 32 pounder was so large that along with the American 105mm and German 128mm designs had proven that conventional anti-tank guns had reached the pinnacle of its development. The anti-tank gun would be replaced after the war by the newer and much lighter weapons such as recoilless rifles and eventually the anti-tank guided missile, which the Germans had experimented heavily late in the war. However, the 17 pounder's service continued throughout many other conflicts around the world, even to this day some militaries capitalizing on its capabilities from mountainous regions where they just don't have the money to buy newer anti-tank guns. Safe to say though the ammunition for this kind of gun is very rare and an almost customizable basis to actually buy or import or create. But the gun itself during World War II was a formidable anti-tank gun platform and feared by most German tank crews of the time. In terms of the gun variants, there was the Mark I, the original version, the Mark II intended for tank use, primarily the Challenger, the Mark III for Navy, which was unused, the Mark IV for the Sherman, the Mark V for the M10, the Mark VI with the shorter breech block for tanks, and the Mark VII for the Sherman. Overall, this gun really did serve its time and helped win the war in World War II, and to this day I still have huge respect for the gunners that operated it and served alongside it throughout conflicts around the world. It's really impressive to know that this thing really did do exactly what the British wanted it to do, was to punch through some of the toughest armor that the Germans had to offer, and clearly with the different projectiles that were modified during the time, it was able to do so. Folks, I hope you enjoyed today's video and learning about this beautiful anti-tank gun. If you did enjoy, please, please click that like button, help me out, help YouTube work with me to get these videos shared around. I'm having a real tough time with military content being worked upon YouTube. It seems like they've got a little bit of bee in their bonnet over my content. If you want to be notified of any upcoming videos I'm producing in the future, please click on the little bell by the subscribe button. And also, if you want to support my channel, I would really appreciate it by checking out my Patreon and my PayPal. For any support you want to give me, I really do appreciate those and thank everyone who has been supporting me so far. I truly do appreciate and thank each and every one of you personally. It means so much to me. Thanks again for stopping by and have a wonderful day. All the best.
Bye-bye.